Um, thank you so much um, for having me here to Google today, uh, to have the opportunity to follow in the footsteps of people who have done these Google Talks is, is uh, pretty daunting, I have to say. Um, I do have a bit of a cough, so um, you'll have to excuse me if I, if I have to uh, take a moment. Um, so <coughs> I always, when I do a talk, I set out a little bit of housekeeping. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is a very emotional subject uh, to me personally, and I'm sure you will probably find it quite an emotional uh, subject to listen to. Um, so if I have to take a moment, it's not because I'm going to lose, and sometimes I just have to take a second just to get myself back together, because I can get quite emotional having these conversations. So you're welcome to laugh at me when I have those <laughs> moments as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is to try and just, if, uh, is to kind of get to know you guys just a, a small little bit. And I was thinking about this last night, and it'll help me to, uh, to kind of make some of my, my, my points uh, a little bit clearer. So, you know, in life, everybody is struggling with something, whether it's within your own mind or whether it's external to your mind. It's somebody in your family, a sickness, a death, uh, an illness, stress, worry, mental anxiety, and so on. We all have something to worry about. Um, they are all equally the same. There is nothing stronger or worse than anybody else's uh, pain or issues that they have. Um, so my whole talk really is about family. And there was two things uh, I was thinking of last night that I'd like to kind of uh, start off. I'm going to do a little survey. Now, you, you can put up your hand or not, whichever uh, you're feeling comfortable with, but hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll uh, just bear with me for a, a second. So um, everybody here is working in Google, okay? So my first question is, when you were in school and college, okay, was Google going to be your number one place to work? When you were in college, you say, right, I'm going, I'm in school, I'm going to leave school, I'm going to go to college because I want to be in Google. Hands up who had that thought in their mindset when they were studying. Good, good, <laughs> great. We had won. Okay, well, he's a real Googler. Yeah, he, he watched that movie we all watched uh, and, we, and we loved it. Okay, so, that, so that's good. Now, how many of you now have a qualification or a training relative to working in Google. So you will need, I presume most of you will have some sort of a qualification or degree or whatever. So a lot of you have trained to do a job that you never really thought that you would be doing. Okay, now, bear with me for a second. The other side of this little uh, equation, um, hands up here anybody who have children. Okay, so there's a good few who have children. Anybody in a, you don't have to answer this, anybody here in a relationship um, that hope maybe one day they will have a family? Okay. Um, now, finally, <coughs> anybody who hasn't put their hand up, is anybody here who was ever in school <coughs> when they were younger, oh, when I grow up I'm going to have a family and get married and have kids? Does that cover the rest of you here? Okay. Right. So... The point of why I wanted to ask this was that I think it's fair to say everybody pretty much in the room has an aspiration to be a parent, okay? Anybody in this room have any formal training on being a parent? <laughs> <laughs> yes, great. So this has all worked exactly how I imagined it at 2 o'clock this morning when I'm going, okay, what am so, the, the point to, to all of this, <coughs> if you can let me you know, be a little bit uh, relaxed on the actual stats, everybody here never really thought about working for Google yet. You're trained to do a job on Google. And everybody here has an aspiration, is or would like to be a parent, and you have no training to be a parent. So what effectively is the most important job of everybody's life is that of being a parent. And there is no formal training out there. Um, and that's really the basis of what my whole message is about and what I'm trying to do. I'm not a trained psychologist. I have a master's in international business. I've been in the corporate uh, business before. So <coughs> by, by the experience that I've been on, I have been inspired to not tell people how to raise their children or what to do or what to eat or what to put on them or what to say. 
all I'm trying to do is to encourage families to have more fun together. And that's the essence of everything I do. I always call it the love, hugs and kisses. So if we can, in our families, as parents, spend more time engaging with our children, show them the love, bring them out to nature and engage with them a little bit more, I think you know, the world would be a better place. <clears throat> and one of the other analogies I was thinking of was, um, you know, parenting is like being in government. You know, you do your best, not everybody's happy, you know, sometimes, you know, and most of politicians in Ireland have no formal training in being in government, and they all go and they, 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 they do what they have to do. Um, so, and then, you know, you give the kids too much, they'd be given out or they'd be complaining or they want something or they'd be bold or, they, you know, they'll go on strike or whatever it is um, as, as the children are getting older. Um, so now we have, you know, the, the bus guys, they're all old, they have their own voice and they are now being bold children or they are being good children because the parents were useless in the first place. So there's the conflict right there between parenting and children. <coughs> now, we've all different kind of parents. Um, God forbid we'll all have Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin as, as uh, our analogy of parents, but there are parents in that kind of category who, who are just in it for themselves. They can become quite selfish. They're not really caring about their children or their, their, their country uh, uh, so far as to what's going on in Syria. So I just wanted to make that analogy of the importance of parenting, um, the importance of having some sort of of, of you know, information about how to, how to parent. And it always boils down to spending time when you're with them, be with them, and, um, and you know, encourage them, inspire them, and spend your time with them. And as I have now, is reading. So that's kind of a little analogy of what I wanted to say in terms of what the content of my story is. So I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. So uh, like you, um, 10 years ago, I was in a corporate world. I worked in Vodafone. My job is pricing. And the idea was, how can we have a pricing plan that makes people think that they're getting great value for money, but spend double the amount of money with us? So I'm sure you're all the same in Google. <laughs> you're all the same in Google. Of, all right, how do we get? And I'm one of those people. Oh, ads and, ooh, and so on. So. Um, <laughs> And I wanted to climb uh, that corporate ladder, and, um, and now we're kind of on the, this other side of this whole equation that I'm talking about, which is you know, our work-life balance and stuff. So luckily I went to work, I worked really hard, I was on my way uh, going up the ranks, um, and I always had time for you know, my family. You know, weekends were always sacred, and we would always go out, it would always be an outing or a walk to the beach, to the park, whatever it is. And um, <coughs> there was one summer, um, we have a place down in British Bay, it's a mobile home. I was there last night, actually if any of you are on Facebook, it's Adam's Cloud, There's, you see a photograph that I took, uh, la not last night, but the night before, and it's, it's quite magical and in incredible. Uh, that photograph is uh, what I call Adam's Bench, and I'm going to talk about Adam now in a moment. But, <coughs> um, so, 10 years ago we were down in this spiritual, magical place called British Bay, and we have a caravan beside the sea, and uh, myself and my wife Jackie, who we met in work, um, we would go down with uh, our three children, Harry, Adam, and Robbie, um, and we loved it. We'd go down at winter, we'd go down at Easter, we'd go down at weekends. And uh, I was on my holidays from work, and I was sitting on the deck, uh, looking out at the kids, they just cut the grass, the kids are making haystacks with it, the sun was shining down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is one of those emotional moments I was telling you about, so feel free to laugh. <laughs> um, so the sun was shining down and I, and I raised a, a glass of wine to my wife and I said, we're in heaven, you know, I have a good job, look at our kids, we're here in this holiday place, the sun is shining, it's just incredible. I was in this bubble, this bubble of happiness, and I, I tried always to stay in my bubble. And <coughs> literally at that moment, um, our then four-year-old Adam uh, came up onto the deck complaining of a headache. And, you know, like all parents, you'd think the worst, oh my God, oh, don't be silly. Anyway, you know, go on into bed and have a lie down. We gave him some cat paw. 
That night, he was up all night, he was complaining of a headache, and um, then the next day, he was complaining of a headache, and then he started vomiting. Um, so then we were starting to get a little bit concerned. We brought him to uh, the doctor. The doctor looked in his ear, looked in his eye, looked down his throat. He said, he seems fine to me. I think everything is okay here. Um, give him some motilium. It'll settle his stomach and give him some calpol and, and see how he goes. Uh, that night, um, my wife had done the previous night. She was up all night, and I said, look, I'll take Adam into bed, and I'll mind him tonight. You, you, have, a, you have a rest. Um, I didn't sleep a wink. Adam was up all night. He was getting sick. He was complaining of a headache. And I went, oh, something's, something's really not right here. So the next day, we brought him to hospital. So I just had my two weeks' holidays. It was a Monday. I was due to go back to work on Monday, and I went, oh, great, day off. Bring him up. Get him on a, a you know, sorted out, and then we'll be back down later on. We went up, he was admitted into hospital, and uh, within about 30 minutes, he, uh, he got sick. I lifted him in my arms, and he went like this. And that was it. Now, he was kept alive through the advances of, of medicine uh, for another number of hours, and they operated on him. And we had no idea what was wrong. You know, what's wrong? Doc? It could be meningitis. We don't know. Like, we, we, he came in with a headache. and So it turned out that he had a massive uh, brain tumour. Um, I've never researched it because I just can't go there, but it was a vascular tumour that just bled. So essentially he had a massive bleed in his brain which caused the swelling, which caused the vomiting, which caused the headaches. So we went from you know, the happiest people. We have life sorted. We know what's life. We spend time with our kids. We're working, you know, we're, we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We were, you know, just finished our holidays to Adam is gone. And Adam had an older brother who was six and a half, and uh, a younger brother, Robbie, who was uh, just gone one. Now, that day I brought him to hospital just happened to be my birthday. <laughs> so that's a lovely time of the year for me. So <clears throat> after all of the, 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 the madness and the... It was very calm, actually. It was a very, very calm experience. There was no shouting or running around. It was actually... If it doesn't sound too strange, it was beautiful the way he left us. It was very, very special. And um, immediately at that moment, I, I turned to Jackie and I said, we, we were very, we told Adam we loved him every day. I played football with him, you know, when he wanted, you know, we spent time, he's, he got, we got so much in in those four years. And I immediately said, I have to tell people, I have to remind people that there's so much to life and, and children need so much time and love and affection and encouragement and all of those things and confidence building. Um, and I said, I need just to remind people. Now, it wasn't a big stick of, oh, you need to spend time with your kids. It was just that reminder that I wanted to get out there. So um, I immediately started writing um, without any thought process in, in, in my mind at all. So I started writing, which I've never published, which is a, a book about a time when I went camping. Adam was four years of age, and we went camping out overnight, and uh, Robbie, was, Robbie was at home with, with his mum. And we had an amazing night, Harry, myself, and a, a few others, and of course Adam. And um, so <coughs> then this whole thing of, okay, I've got to remind parents, what do we do? So I said, okay. And I, I, I mentioned this uh, at my speech at the funeral, was that if every parent can spend an extra 10 minutes a day and tell their children they love them before they go to sleep, the world will be a better place. Because if any of you who have the children here are like me, I shout and scream at them and I'm giving out, come on, put your coat on, hurry up, oh, for God's sake, eat your dinner. And we're all doing that. So if you think of a, of a, of a, of a, a small person who are getting those messages all day of hurry up and come on and quickly and you're late or whatever, and then they go to bed and all of that is in their mind for the day. They wake up the next day and then it starts again. There's no break. There's no, okay, why, what am I doing? Why, is, why are people at me all of the time? Because we're all busy, and it's what, what most parents do, or well, the Irish ones anyway. Um, so the point is, <coughs> is that 10 minutes at the end of the day and telling your children you love them is a big, huge eraser. It rubs out all the shouting, and it sends them to bed happy, knowing that they're loved, and they're going to have a nicer sleep, and they're going to wake up the next morning feeling happier. Now, as I said, I'm not a trained psychologist, but I'm a huge believer that that 10 minutes every night spent with children, I believe, um, and I've no research to back this up, is going to help with 
so many mental health issues, anxiety issues with children, confidence issues, everything that children need, um, just that 10 minutes every day is going to help. And if nothing else was done other than a walk in the park and that 10 minutes one-on-one -on -one at bedtime where you can have your chat. So my, that's my message and that's what I have been inspired about. And you know, going back to love, loss, and inspiration, you know, I couldn't have, <laughs> I couldn't have loved Adam any more um, than, 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 you know, I just, I, it was impossible to love any of my children, and my wife, indeed, of course, as well. Um, he was gone, you know, he was lost. Um, and, and now I've been inspired with a message to try and change the world, is what I'm trying to do. I'm doing it on my own. Um, so I wrote this book, Before You Sleep, and it just represents a parent and a child together going on a magical adventure together. And just the text is very simple. I love you much more than the sun, moon and stars, even much more than the red planet Mars. If we could together fly in a big rocket ship, what fun we would have on a magical trip. And, and, and so it goes on. And it, and it um, references love to the love uh, of, you know, I love you much more than pirates and Halloween and Christmas and diggers and dinosaurs and all the stuff that kids love and parents actually love as well. But it also then... Uh, relates the reader and the child in the book together going on their magical adventures. So it brings that bond together. So without knowing anything about the publishing industry, I publish my book. What does that mean? It means you've got to finance it and find a way how to sell it. Everyone was like, how did you publish your book? And I went, well, I don't know. I just printed it and I'm trying to sell it, and that's publishing. Um, and ignorance is bliss because I had no idea you know, how many books I would sell and so on. So I printed 10,000 copies, <laughs> and uh, we used to laugh in, in uh, my family would kind of go, oh, Jesus, he's printed 10,000 copies. You know, we're all going to have to buy at least 1,000 each. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and, you know, we had this vision of, uh, I'm just going to the toilet. No, don't go in there, because that's where like, the books would be. You'd, pile, you'd open the door, and they'd all fall out. So, um, so uh, what happened was... Um, I published the book, 10,000, I haven't a clue. I mean, you know, I actually probably only should have printed 500 or 1,000. But um, I was interviewed on Ireland AM and with Ryan Tuberty. Um, and actually, the book came out on Adam's first anniversary. So to have within that year, and on his first anniversary, we had uh, a new baby as well. And, and the reason why I'm saying that was we didn't back down. We knew we were in trouble. And we said, we've got to get out of this. No one can help us out of this. We can ring Joe Duffy all day and we're not going to get anywhere with him because he's just going to hear my story and then they'll be on to the next one. We had a, we had a major fight on our hands for the survival of our family <laughs> and our minds as well. Um, and so that's, that's what we did. So within the first year in Adam's anniversary, we had a baby girl. Uh, so now we had an angel in heaven, two boys and a little girl. Uh, we had a book coming out. <laughs> And life was still hard, but it was beautiful. It was wonderful, and it was very special. Um, Before You Sleep went to number one. It sold 10,000 copies in six weeks. And I went, OK, that's easy, you know. <laughs> 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 to all books do this. And ignorance is wonderful, because I just thought that was it. <laughs> so I went on to my printer. I said, another 10,000. She said, you're mad. You're, you're just mad. Don't. You've, you've had your run, the way the industry works, you have a big blip and then it all fizzles out. And I went, ah, oh, look, I'll sell them somewhere, I have my website and so on. And, uh, so then another 10,000, um, and they were gone before Christmas. So I launched on the 13th of August, and 20,000 copies were gone before Christmas, and I was on for another reprint. And she said, okay, I know I told you the last time not to go mad, but don't go mad this time. <laughs> I went, 10,000 copies. Um, and then uh, I, uh, I had my 10,000 copies, and um, February came. And then I went, I still have 10,000 copies. And <laughs> March came, I still have 10,000 copies, because the, the Christmas period had, had, had run. Um, I was still working in Vodafone at the time. I wrote my second book, which is a space adventure. Um, and that came out um, after a, a huge event in my life with the book which was I entered before you seep into the Irish Book Awards. Now, to be a self-published author, I you know, didn't have a, a publisher, I don't have an agent, I don't have any publicity and all that sort of stuff. That, uh, that book was, was taken in um, to, uh, to a shortlist of four. 
and I uh, got as many of my family around a, a, a ten-seater table, I think we had 13, <laughs> uh, and we stuffed them all in and it was more of a thank you to them, not expecting to win but hoping. It was a thank you for my family because they helped us through so much and I said, look, this is a celebration. So I'm getting emotional because I'm thinking of the night. Uh, so when, um, when we won the book award, I you know, was sitting down and they were going through it and here are the nominations and the winner is, and I'm going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And uh, it was <sighs> Benji Bennett for Before You Sleep. Um, I can't tell you the, the feeling uh, that that was, not because I won a book award, I didn't care about that, but it was Adam was there, it's his message and he's minding his dad. So for me, that was more about this message is real, Adam is real, he is pushing me, he is driving me, he is inspiring me to do what I'm doing. Ever since then I haven't stopped, uh, I've now written eight books, uh, I've been nominated for four of the times uh, for the Irish Book Awards and I won it again for my other book Before You Sleep. Um, I launched Before You Sleep over in America, now again I'm on my own. Okay, so, and I don't have a big, you know, back finance backing behind me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I went to the London Book Fair and I found a stripper here in the US and he said, okay, we like this, we like this book. You know, we're going to take it on. And I went, great. And I said, look, I think I'll be able to get some publicity. Um, so, went off the printer and I said, 20,000 books for the US. And she goes, Jesus. <laughs> 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 you know, and it is, it is you know, uh, uh, later. And... Um, so I had my 20,000 uh, paperbacks printed and then my distributor comes along and said, look, I was in with Barnes & Noble and they said that, look, if you can get that, um, the publicity over in America, uh, they'll take your book in, but they want a hard copy. And I'm like, okay, well, I've just printed 20,000 softbacks with the dollar and all the rest and now you want hardbacks. And I went, okay, it's just stock. I'll eventually sell them and whatever. So... Um, so off I went and I printed 15,000 hardback copies and um, sent them over to the US last August. And I got in touch with a PR agent over in the US uh, and she said, yeah, I think I can get you on. This is going to be great. It's brilliant. And I went, oh my God. This is gonna be and of course then um, the uh, onto Ellen and onto the Today Show and all these kind of guys. Oh, no, not at the moment. And, you know, Donald Trump is all over the news and I was trying to, you know, launch my book you know, at the worst possible time in US political history because it was Donald and Hillary everywhere. You just couldn't get anything. Uh, so I didn't get any pu publicity whatsoever. Um, and then the distributor came and they said, uh, okay, you know, you haven't got the publicity, Barnes and Noble, they're not taking in any of your books. I'm going, oh, Jesus, I've got, you know, 20,000 softbacks, 15,000 hardbacks. <laughs> oh, my God. And, and nobody's selling them. So I got on to my uh, beloved... Adam's Cloud Facebook page. Adam's Army is what I call them. It's an army of people who are helping me and carrying me through by, by spreading uh, the message of, of the love, hugs and kisses. And uh, I said, guys, just launched over in America. Uh, if we can get some good reviews on Amazon, that means Amazon might present my book to more of their customers and we might sell some. Again, ignorance is bliss. I didn't have a clue. So 500 five-star reviews later, <laughs> within three days, I'm going, oh my God, this, this, this is unbelievable. And it wasn't just that they were five-star reviews, it's what people said about the Before You Sleep book. It's touched people on such a level. I mean, the stories I can tell you, how it's helped people who have lost their children, um, how it's helped people with, uh, who, who, who have sick children, um, grandparents, parents, everybody. <coughs> um, they were fanatical in what they were writing. It was like, buy this book, buy this book. Just don't even think about it. Um, and then it was a case of, okay, that's great. I have these reviews up, but nobody's seeing it. So I started advertising um, on Facebook. And um, all of a sudden, uh, the sales started coming in. And I went, oh, that's good. I'm looking at the, you know, my chart position, 120,000. Oh, that's not bad. Like, that's out of all books on Amazon. Okay. 100,000, oh great, that's brilliant. You know, 90,000, 50,000, oh my God, 10,000, oh my God. And the top selling, 10,000 books. I don't have a publisher. Nobody knows about me over in America. It's on Amazon.com. This is amazing. 5,000, oh, brilliant. 
<coughs> on Black Friday, um, we got to number three in the children's charts and number 600 over all books. So I'm competing with the HarperCollins, the Worldwide, everybody. And there is my little Before You Sleep book. Again, Adam <laughs> doing, doing his work and doing his job. Um, so thankfully, on the run-up uh, between Amazon and a, and, a, and a few others, we sold 10,000 copies of the hardbacks in the US without anybody knowing who I am I, and, and the publicity, uh, no publicity. So that, for me, is not anything about, you know, you know my dad says, oh, you'll, you'll make your look and all that sort of stuff. But what it is, and it's one of the things I always like to, to, to get across to any time I'm, I'm doing a talk, is that we all need goals in our lives, okay? Um, you know, we all need to have, you know, whether it's in work, whether it's our family. Um, my number one goal when I started, <laughs> if I can try and contain myself, my number one goal and priority when all of this started, I wanted desperately for Adam's picture to be on TV. That was my biggest driver behind it. Okay? It wasn't about selling a thousand or a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand books. It wasn't about winning the book awards. I had a job, I was just doing it. But my one thing was I wanted Adam to be on the television. And the other thing was I wanted to spread this message of love, hugs and kisses and help families. Not, as I said, what you eat or what they should wear, where you should go and so on. Just spend time with them, talk to them, engage them. They're cleverer than we think. And with just those two things, this journey has been absolutely spectacularly amazing. So to, to go from where we were, which was, you know, deeply in love, happily married, this magical bubble that I'm in, life was great, we're, we're, wasn't any debt and the average person. We were right at the top of the, uh, the, the bubble, the last bubble that we had. And literally the day we lost Adam was the day that the bubble the bubble burst, both in Ireland and for my own family as well. And to be able to go through that uh, and how we made it was the love of a family, spending time with our children and just focusing on those important things in life. And the important things are providing for your family. We've all got to work. You know, some people say, oh, the work-life balance. We are all struggling, but we've got to just make that time. And for me, if we can inspire our children and make that difference, because they are the new legislators, they are the new politicians, they are the new government, they are the new Googlers, they are the new doctors, they are everybody. And if they have compassion and love and affection in their life, that's the multipli multiplier effect. And, um, you know, and I think we can, we can make a, a big change. So um, that's probably a half an hour. So <laughs> Thank you, Benji. Thank you. for sharing your story and Adam's story. It's Thank you. It's beautiful. It's obviously very emotional. Um, so we'll start with a lighter question. Good. <laughs> so you, you, you worked in business yes. originally. And then you, you took a, a very big leap of faith. Yeah. When did you know that you that other than the, you know, the the bathroom door that couldn't be opened because it was full of books? Yeah, you, um, it was almost immediately because again, what happened to us? And as I said at the start, everybody has something that they're struggling with. Everybody does, and you see them in, in on the street, and they may have a bad day. Um, I knew straight away I did not want to be, you know, the guy in the office. I, leave him, he's a bit mad, his son died a few years ago and he's, you know, we just leave him in here and hide in this kind of corporate environment. Yeah. I would have, I would have, you know, lost and, and I would have died myself in there. Um, because, you know, you know, selling minutes on a network, what did that mean to me anymore? It didn't mean anything. I mean, you know, doing this analysis and being passionate about, oh, we should do, because I was always very passionate in work. Um, so I almost knew straight away that I needed to do something different. So when I started writing the book, it was like, well, I'm, you know, there was no plan. I just started doing it. And, 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 and because I had this goal, you know, change the world <laughs> uh, on my own. Um, and, um, you know, spread this message of, of love, hugs and kisses. So that's really where it happened. I knew I, knew I needed a change, mm -hmm. uh, both in work, what I did, and, you know, the life that I, that I led. So you have uh, three surviving children, yes. Harry, Robbie and Molly. Correct. How old are they now? So uh, Harry is now 16. Wow. Uh, he is on transition year. He is uh, building a community centre in Brazil. 
uh, as part of that. So yes, um, so they had to, to raise their funds and he's gone off and 17 in the class out of 120 were picked. And it's an amazing experience and he's so excited, he's been on the phone and, and it's brilliant. Uh, then we have uh, Robbie, who uh, he is 10, and Molly, who is eight. There's um, two years between them. They are best friends, they are, they are like that. And uh, a lot of my social media content, because Harry's off doing his thing pretty much, a lot of my social media is just what they're doing, you know, and the fun, where I'm bringing them, what I'm doing with them, the conversations that they have together. Um, it's just brilliant and I love to observe, uh, observe them as well, so. Harry um, features in some of your books in the, um, in the, the yeah. adventure. Yeah. And um, so the others, do they yeah. Well? The, the, the Before You Sleep was my first one, and that was Adam the character uh, with a parent. Now it's kind of, as you can see from the photographs with the ripped uh, muscles, it's 100% shaped on my physique and, and uh, good looks. <laughs> so that's a joke, of course. Um, and then the space book, because Adam was, or Harry was six and a half when we lost uh, Adam, I wanted to have something for him. So it was Harry and Adam, just the two of them went off on this big adventure. Uh, the next one was uh, a Christmas one because I'm a nutter for Christmas and I love, I love Christmas. And there's a lovely message in the Christmas book. And that's when I introduced Fluff. Mm -hmm. Because as my kids were small, they weren't getting up to mischief or going on adventures. So it was just Adam and Fluff. And then on my fourth book, um, Adam, uh, Adam's Pirate Treasure, that's when I introduced all of the kids okay. into it and Molly is in that and so on. Uh, so they've grown and my books have grown as I've grown uh, as, a, as a dad and as my children have grown. And uh, yeah, so all my kids are in them. Fluff flies them wherever they need. And now this year, I have a new book coming out in, se in September and Bailey, our dog, is now part right. of the action as well. That's so we've got, we got kind of close to Famous Five <laughs> going on now, so it's good. And has yeah. the age range changed then for the, the focus of um, No, my, some, of, some of my books will be a little bit more educational. They'll be a bit, um, you know, I have uh, my inventions one, it's time travel and inventions. Um, we don't have Google as the invention in there. We, we, so we have Apple, all right, yeah. We, <laughs> but, um, so, um, yeah, so they, they will deal with, um, certain themes. So, you know, the inventions, what's, or even the world of wonders, what's the most wonderful thing in the world? And they go off looking for it, like we all do. And we're trying to find out what's the most wonderful thing in the world. And it's represented by the Colosseum, the pyramids, and the Taj Mahal. And Adam comes back and he goes, do you know what? I don't think I've quite found it. I, I just don't feel I've got it. And then it's a kiss and a hug at bedtime and a big hug and a squeeze. And it kind of goes, ah, that's, I didn't have to leave my home because that's what it is. And that's what, uh, so, um, the illustrations are very broad. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the themes will be a little bit older, um, and uh, but the, the age range is from babies to about nine years of age. Great. So I'm very lucky with Excellent. that. That's great. Yeah. So sli slightly more personal question, and after this one, then we'll we'll open up the audience questions. So I'm not a mother yet. Yeah. I have to qualify. <laughs> um, but I have two beautiful nephews. Yeah. And I have. I s don't struggle in any way telling yeah. them that I love them. Yeah. I probably don't say it enough, but I'll, I'll, I'll improve after hearing your talk. But saying I love you is difficult to another adult. Mm. M maybe not to a husband or a wife, but to your friend or your brother or your sister. That, that's, yeah. more, that's more difficult. You've been mm. asked for advice on that. Yeah, or, or uh, it's funny. I, I, I've never been asked that question before. And yes, it is a kind of a, a, a funny one. Um, now, you know, my kids will tell each other they love them and they tell me I love them and so on. And that, that's a normal family thing. Uh, but as you get older, it does seem to be, you know, friends and so on, or, you know, when you're in school or whatever, if you told your best friend you loved them, oh God, I think he's gay or whatever, <laughs> you know, you'd have, you'd, have, you'd have that type of thing. Um, so to, to say those words, it's not just about saying them. And that's what I was talking about time, spending time with them and inspiring them. Like, for example, um, uh, my, when I was younger, my dad used to bring myself, like we have six kids and two of them were younger and two, uh, two of my brothers were older. And myself and my sister were kind of in the middle. And there was a, a stage where my dad would bring the two of us up to the mountains in Wicklow with the dog. And I loved it. And to this day, I still absolutely love it. And I remember the chats that we would have up there. Do you know what I mean? And even the time the Stardust fire, uh, we were actually up at the top of that. And I remember that. 
and he just gave me a hug and oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking of the, the people in that tragedy, but uh, he, he gave me a hug and, you know, he didn't say, you know, I love you, but we were up on the top of a mountain. I was about, whatever, nine years or ten years of age or whatever it was, and it was a wonderful experience. And all of those walks I loved. Now, he's, he has inspired me, and this is what I'm talking about, the inspiration for our children. He has inspired me to do that with my children. And my children love going out. They're outdoorsy, they climb trees, they do that and they are healthy and they are happy. And so that expression of love doesn't necessarily have to be verbal. Mm -hmm. You know, you can tell somebody you love them, um, you know, but, you know, if I don't put the bins out for my wife, she's kind of, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'd have to do that because, not to show her that I love her, but it's because I love her, that's why I'm going to do it. So it doesn't have to be the words. I, I think the actions are very important to, mm -hmm. to, to do that. So saying the words uh, can be uncomfortable. Don't worry, just do, just do the nice things, I think. But I always tell the kids you love them because they're smaller and they need to be told as well. Yeah. But I think we all need to be told we're and loved. I, think, I, yeah. I think we are. Thank yeah, so Thank tell your neighbours now. You can tell each other you love <laughs> each other. <laughs> uh, hi, guy, love you. <laughs> Hugs for everybody at lunchtime. Yeah, so oh, I'm serious. <laughs> we, um, does anyone like to ask a question? We might get to the microphone. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, well, the big goal eventually is puppets and TV screens and movies and, and all that sort of stuff. But no, I'd never written before, but um, in Vodafone, uh, I, I had to communicate. I used to kind of joke. It's like, right, I've got to tell all these people who know nothing about pricing, you know, what's going on and, uh, and so on. So my communication skills uh, were developed in a business environment. Um, why the writing? Um, again, there was no thought process here. So we lost Adam. We were absolutely devastated. Uh, we had a, a young, a, a, you know, a young one-year-old. And um, I just sat down and I just started writing. And I just wanted to remember the fun that I had with Adam because I'd be very little video. And we didn't have a huge amount of photographs of him because there was no uh, camera phones back then, unfortunately. So I kind of went, I got I to, certain things I have to remember. I have to remember spirit and a smile. So that's why... I wrote was for myself, and a lot of people who have gone through trauma like that wi will will write because it gives them uh, something out of it. Um, so that was that was that was it. And then, you know, to be able to put something in the hand of parents where the words are from the parent into the child's ear are the words "I love you." It, I mean, there can't be a more powerful, stronger way of delivering Adam's message there, and that's that's really what it was. So. I never wanted to be a writer, <laughs> you know, so, but I am. What, what, was, what was the essence of the book called like, Given That yeah. Story of the Writer? And given like the children uh, story book, like the illustrations, like the sort of the bits and moments of it? Yeah, okay, thanks for that. Uh, so um, I'll come on to the editing bit in a minute, but any time I'm writing a book, I have a full vision of exactly what my crazy kids are doing in the scene. So, um, and I know where fluff is going to be and I know I the environment they're, they're going to be in. So for the first one is, I love you much more than, you know, uh, the, the, the deepest blue sea. And I said, right, okay, we've got to have the parent and the child going on an adventure underwater. And, you know, crazy stuff. Well, fishes go to school. You'd be inspired by certain, you know, Disney. I love, you know, the, the Disney stuff and Nemo's and stuff. And I went... Okay then, so we need all the fishes going to school and the submarine buses, you know what I mean? Oh, there's a line, you know what I mean? So, so as I'm doing my, my writing, those images are in my head. Now I can never imagine how they're going to turn out. So um, when I'd finished the book, and it's funny, that was in crumples of paper, and I'd go out to any stranger who'd listen. I had a beard, long hair, my jumper was on inside out and back to front. I was like a crazy man. Have a look at that. And they go, oh, that's really lovely. And of course they're going to say that because it's a crumpy piece of paper and so on. But a lot of, you know, the feedback that I did get uh, was, was very powerful. They just said it's very simple. Um, so on my first book, I, I wrote a 30-page brief on the illustrations. Uh, so uh, I sent pictures of, of, of Adam, any videos that we had, you know, the team. I wanted everything to be happy. I wanted a tree to be smiling. I wanted a submarine to have a smile. Every, you know, everything was personalised in the book. It's this wonderful world of happiness. It's my bubble. 
And then I got into some detail on the specific uh, images. So I gave an overall theme and then the specific ones. And, um, and luckily, you know, I found a great illustrator through Cartoon Saloon. Um, you know, spent a fortune on it. I went to the bank and again, didn't, no, no plan. I went to the bank and I said, you know, I need 12 grand for illustrations. And they're going, oh, Jesus, 10,000 books and 12 grand, oh, you know. And no, no thought process whatsoever. Um, it was just that inspiration of get Adam on the TV and spread the message. And then the editing was, like, I mean, I got a, I think it was a D in pass English in the leave insert, uh, probably because they couldn't understand my writing. Um, but, you know, punctuation is probably my biggest and grammar. Um, so I just got somebody I knew who was able to just straighten it out. They didn't change necessarily anything that I wrote. They just fixed it up for, you know, that blaring mistakes. <laughs> and there is one or two that I go, oh, sugar, we missed that one. But <coughs> yeah, so that, that's, that's the process that I went through. And um, again, just kept it simple, you know. First of all, <laughs> my condolences uh, to, to both you and your family because it does extend to the whole family. And, you know, everybody here has got either a parent, you know, a cousin, a brother, a sister, somebody, you know, and what I was saying earlier on. Um, grief is so different for so many different people. I, I a very close friends of ours had a particularly tragic situation and, you know, he's barely, he, he, he's barely, you know, operating. And you don't operate properly for the first year. As I said, you know, uh, you know, I'd just sit in a chair, you know, and I'd be talking, thinking I was okay, but people looking, you know, inward are going, oh my God, they're, they're a mess. Um, and for you looking in at them, it's like that. I always use the, um, the driver, backseat driver analogy. If you're ever driving a car, you know, you're fine, you're in control. But like if my wife is driving the car, it's like, oh my God, she's driving too close or she's not looking or did she see that bike and you're worrying about them. And it's the same with grief. When you're looking in on it, it's, you're just looking at their raw pain. Now, they have it and it's, it's, it's horrific uh, and it is survivable. Uh, for me and what I've learned and with the work I've done with Bardstown, I've raised 50,000 euros from donations of the book to the charity. Uh, from, from what I've learned is it's a celebration uh, for me, Adam was always a celebration. As I said, when we lost him, it was quite a beautiful experience. His funeral was was so magical. Um, and then you have your 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 meltdown and your 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 breakdown, and you'll have that. Um, you know, keeping busy is is always important, but to always celebrate them, he our, uh, their child will always be on their mind. So never be afraid to. You know, people say to me, "Oh God, you're." I don't know him from Adam. You know that expression, it's an Irish expression. And they go, oh God, I'm sorry, and so it's fine. I was thinking about Adam before you even said that. So they will always be thinking of them. And um, all you can do is just keep ringing, just meeting, just listen from your perspective. For them, they just have to find their way um, and celebration and usually doing something, whether it's planting a tree or putting up a bench or whatever, just to do something for them is always a, a nice thing. But it's impossible to imagine what you go through. I mean, I can't even imagine it now because we're 10 years on and we are blissfully happy and Adam is amazing and our life is so spiritual and everything around us is wonderful. But for, for, for when you're starting off, it's just no hope. Um, and to talk to other people who have lost their children as well. Because for me, I didn't want to hear anybody's story. I just wanted to hear how long have you gone and how is your life? Because I was so fearful that I was going to be finished. Yeah. Yes. So when I wrote my first book, um, as I was writing it, we went on the bereavement camp with Barrettstown. And again, no plan. Um, so uh, when, um, when we lost Adam, there was a golf thing on and it was cancelled. So all of the money for it was just given to a charity. And somebody suggested to me Barrettstown. I didn't know, I heard of them, but I didn't know a huge amount about them. And I said, yeah, you know, whatever. And then I, uh, when we went down, uh, we went on a bereavement camp and I said, do you know, it'd be nice to be able to do something extra. Now, on my commercial mind, I knew that I wouldn't be able to do the whole thing just for a charity. I was hoping that maybe it would be something that I could make a career out of. Uh, it wasn't too sure. So I said, look, 
I just want to make a small donation from the sale of each book. The idea is that um, as long as I'm alive and as long as that book is selling, you're going to get a percentage straight off the top. And they went, oh, God, we'd love that. Thanks a million. So that's how that started. Then when I was doing the space book, um, Make a Wish contacted me and they said, oh, we heard about your book. You know, would you be interested in helping us grant wishes? And I went, Adam granting wishes. Oh, my God. I mean, that's, that's, just, that's the best thing ever. So they got the next two books. Then um, Lower Lynn is, is a charity I, I, I know well, not through personal, but I, I just know of them and I love the work that they're doing. So I rang them and I said, look, I'm doing my books. You know, I, you don't have to do anything. I'm not asking for anything. Do you, do you want this percentage? And it went, great. So that's, that's really what it is. And then Anam Cara as well is a parent bereavement support group. So that's really, uh, it's all charity, our children related charities that, I, that, I, that I'm helping. So, uh, so I love it and it's amazing. And for Adam to grant wishes and, and, and help families through uh, is, is incredible. It's amazing, Benji. You've done wonders for his um, his memory. Thank you. It's, it's beautiful. Can you tell us you have eight books? Eight books. One jigsaw. One jigsaw. What's and you're in the US, so what's what's next? Oh God, well in the US is just to try and you know get the US going a little bit better. Um, I have a new book coming out in September. Uh, a lot of where I'm selling them uh, now is through the bookshops online, but a lot of kind of events, like I, I, go, I was in the RDS, the Pregnancy and Baby Fair, so a lot of promoting all of the time, mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, it's what pays the bills. Yeah. Um, so I am out uh, a lot of the time. I'd like to be doing a little bit more blogging, but uh, the last year has been very successful, and if we have a good year, so uh, hopefully all you Googlers can tell all those Googlers in America about my books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm doing my book tour. I go and do talk over there as well. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. We'll yeah. have, to, have so. to look into it. Well, thank you very much. Great. For your thank, you so much. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Megan. Thanks a lot.